from this book, The Battle of Adwa. African Victory in the Age of Empire by <clears throat> Raymond Jonas. Part one, The Road to Adwa. On, on this map because the borders were created by European colonizers. Introduction. This is the story of a world turned upside down on the 1st of March 1896, not far from the Ethiopian town of Adwa, an African army won a spectacular victory over a European army. Africans had defeated Europeans before at its Isandlwana, for example, but these proved to be mere setbacks in otherwise inexorable conquests. Ethiopian victory over Italy at the Battle of Adwa was decisive. It brought an Italian war of conquest to an end. In an age of relentless European expansion, Ethiopia alone, alone had successfully defended its independence. In a view, in, inevitably, Ethiopian victory was interpreted in racial terms, for not only had an African army defeated a European army, but a black army had defeated a white army. Adwa thus cast doubt upon an unshakable certainty of the age that sooner or later Africans would fall under the rule of Europeans. Adwa not only is not only the founding event in the history of modern Ethiopia and not only a founding trauma in the young life of the modern Italian nation. Adwa is, I would argue, part of our global heritage. It was one of those events we call world historical, quote unquote, because we can readily imagine the world our world taking a different path had events gone differently. Adwa opened a, bre a breach that would lead in the aftermath of World War 50 years later to the rollback of European rule in Africa. It was an event that determined the color of Africa. The story of Adwa has its core a number of compelling personalities. Chief among them is Menelik, a provincial monarch who claimed a biblical ancestry originating with the liaison between King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. Menelik parlayed these assets into a claim on the Ethiopian throne. Menelik had more than inspired ancestry in his favor, he had an acute strategic imagination in a manner reminiscent of Otto von Bismarck of Prussia. Menelik used aggressive external belligerence to subdue his rivals and so to lay claim to the title of the empire, emperor of Ethiopia. Mm. A key collaborator was Daitu Betul. In her use, a prophecy told her that she would wear a crown. She had already gone through at least two husbands before marrying Milenik at the age of 30, making good on the prophecy. Her quick wit and shrewd political sense brought balance to Milenik's cautious and deliberate leadership style. She also brought geographic balance when Menelik and Taitu met, he was merely king of Shoa, a province in southern Ethiopia. His marriage to Taitu gave him a smart, energetic political partner with a power base in the north, confirming Menelik as a leader with a claim to truly national credentials. Taitu 
with a strong personality who didn't shrink from the harsh measures, whether, whether against the encroaching Europeans or against rivals for Menelik's affection. Second, at court only to the emperor himself, Daitu led a faction that opposed Menelik's tentative embrace of the Europeans, favoring a bold and aggressive military response. A blend of Daitu's ardent maximalism and Menelik's brilliant gamemanship, gamesmanship culminated in the triumph at Adwa. Ethiopian triumph owed almost as much to the soft power of propaganda as to blood and steely might. But uh, by appealing to sympathies abroad, Ethiopia pioneered the defining strategy of modern anti-colonial struggles, the campaign for hearts and minds. The drive to abolish the slave trade decades earlier had shown that European public opinion could be engaged in the fate of Africa if offered a compelling story. Before a single shot was fired, Menelik and Daitu waged a savvy public opinion campaign in Europe. Since 1878, Menelik had relied on the Swiss engineer Alfred Ilg, his trusted advisor and factotum, for advice in dealing with Europe. In the 1890s, Menelik repeatedly deployed Ilg to Europe to help shape the emperor's image and that of Ethiopia. In a series of brilliant strokes, Ilg assimilated Ethiopia to European landscapes and conventions. Ilg touted Mount Tennis, Ethiopia as Africa's Switzerland, a representation boosted in a postcard campaign. The card featured a collage of pleasing sketches, mini lake and regal profile, Ethiopia's rugged high mountains, to cool red rendered with suspiciously Swiss orderliness. Ilg also secured the key markers of durable sovereignty so rare in Africa, postage stamps and coins embossed with Minilik's likeness. Ilg's collaborator, the freelance journalist Casimir Mondon Vidalhet, had been promoting Minilik and Ethiopia since 1892 via features in the European press. Mondon Vihalhet is a classic example of a European going abroad to refashion himself. Sources refer to a shady past he sought to escape in Ethiopia. Described as slippery by his enemies and adroit by his friends, Mondon effectively functioned as Minilik's chief publicist. His dispatches fed European readers with a comfortable blend of the alluringly exotic and the reassuringly familiar. His descriptions of the European court conjured a romanticized medieval Europe. Sometimes I ask myself if our own chivalrous Middle Ages haven't risen from the grave to seek on this airy Ethiopian plateau a final and safe refuge, he wrote. Besides appealing to European medieval nostalgia, Mondon's characterization quietly suggested that Ethiopia would, in the fullness of time, mature into, into a comfort, comfortingly familiar European present. Mondon also underlied Ethiopia's Christian heritage. His features celebrated many likes triumphs over his Muslim neighbors, thus assimilating Ethiopia's struggles to those of Christian Europe and the larger global community of Christendom. The cross had defeated the crescent, he wrote jubilantly following a brutal campaign against the Muslim Walaita. When Italy moved against Ethiopia the following year, Mondon appealed to the European sympathies on behalf of Ethiopia. The Ethiopian emperor understands European public opinion, he wrote. He counts on feelings of justice shared by all Christian peoples. The official portrait of Menelik 
circulated by what could be called his public relations team, featured a serene head of state, the antithesis of the cliched barbarian African, with a large crucifix worn high at the neck. European newspapers obligingly printed the portrait as they played up a sympathetic image of, quote, Africa's Christian monarch, unquote. Against all odds, these efforts helped to turn Menelik and Daitu into celebrities in Europe and America. By the turn of the century, Menelik had his own tableau in wax at the Musée Grevin in Paris, a sure marker of notoriety in popular culture. Vanity Fair profiled Menelik as the subject of one of its famous color lithographs, a distinction that put him in the company of such figures as Charles Darwin and Benjamin Disarelli. Felix Potin, the pioneering chain store merchant, featured Menelik and Taitu in a collectible card series of bankable fin de siècle personalities doled out one card per visit. Adwa's aftermath mattered too. The scope of the disaster of Adwa was such that someone would have to pay. In Italy, the government of Fran- Francesco Crisipi fell. His political career ended. General Oreste Barat- Baratieri, the commanding officer who had the misfortune of surviving Adwa, was put on trial even before he left Africa. Baratieri's trial played as a scripted drama on the themes of hubris, race, and betrayal. Hundreds of Italians were taken prisoner after Adwa. It was a racial turning of the tables that put whites at the mercy of blacks in significant numbers for the first time. The prisoners were billeted upon the Ethiopian population for nearly a year, opening the door to retaliation and cruel revenge that never came. Instead, many prisoners developed close relationships with their guardian slash captors, becoming friends and occasionally lovers. A surprising number of them left memoirs. A few of them were excellent observers. These accidental anthropologists will have their say, as will the entrepreneurs, Greeks, Armenians, Jews, Swiss, who operated as independent agents in Ethiopia, selling arms to Menelik and confounding our understanding of imperialism as a a coordinated enterprise of statesmen, soldiers, and merchants. Indeed, the the story of the drive to conquer Ethiopia subverts much received wisdom about how imperialism operated and what drove it. Ethiopia made no sense as a settlement colony, as an outlet for investment capital, as a source of raw materials, or as a market for surplus production. It yielded no tangible political advantages among an electorate largely indifferent to the lure of imperial grandeur. The Italian bourgeoisie ridiculed ridiculed the vision of Italian East Africa, notably through its journalistic mouthpiece, the Milan-based Corriere della Sera. They rightly diagnosed Africa Italiana as a pathological projection of the ambitions of Italy's political leaders who preferred to spend millions in pursuit of imperial glory while they ignored the urgent but more prosaic need for investment at home. A close examination of the failed conquest of Ethiopia reveals not the operation of vast imperial forces, but the convergence of individual vanities and ambitions. The pursuit of empire is shown to be driven by distinct personalities. Frustrated careerist administrators, ambitious officers, failed characters seeking sanctuary or redemption in overseas exploits, privateer merchants in pursuit of the killer deal, 
and most crucially, political leaders seduced by the idea that empire is where was where both personal and national greatness could be found. Around the globe, Adwa gave the lie to the ine- inevitably inevitability of European domination, both political and racial. Findesicle culture in Europe and in the United States confidently predicted Africa's future in terms of in terms redolent of manifest destiny. In 1896, on the eve of the Battle of Adwa, the Atlanta Constitution noted that Africa was already carved up and possessed by the different governments of Europe. The Europeans, the Constitution observed, quote, are all repeating in Africa the work of colonization, which has made America populous, and before them the Negro must go, as did the Indian in America, unquote. Assumptions about political domination and racial superiority were thus entwined. By setting back one, Adwa shattered pious certainties about the other. Nearly a hundred years before the abolition of apartheid, Adwa set in motion the long unraveling of European domination of Africa just as it provoked a rethinking of seemingly settled issues about race. Figures throughout the African diaspora grasped the significance of Adwa, Menelik, and independent Ethiopia. Some, such as Benito Sylvain of Haiti and Joseph Vitalin of the West Indies, saw in Ethiopia a beacon, a kind of Zion, that made and made the pilgrimage from the Americas. Others, such as Booker T. Washington, Ida B. Wells, and W.E.B. Du Bois became, quote, virtual pilgrim, pilgrims, unquote, who visited and elaborated an Ethiopia of the imagination. In so doing, they anticipated the real and virtual pilgrimages taken by the Rastafarians a generation or so later. In the aftermath of Adwa, it was tempting for some Europeans and Americans to explain away the exception of Ethiopian victory and to soothe the sting of white defeat by discounting Italy as a worthy and capable colonial power. But empire was never an exclusive big power game. Portugal, Belgium, and the Dutch had carved out their pieces of empire. Why not Italy? History loves exceptions. This book seeks not to explain away the exception of Adwa, but to embrace it. Patterns around in history and it patterns abound in history, and it is tempting for us to discern in an accumulation of instances an otherwise inscrutable underlying pattern. Exceptions create that rare opportunity to separate the contingent from the inevitable, to recognize in discrete choices and chance occurrences the branching path of human endeavor. The story of Adwa represents one such opportunity, for in pitting one of the most integrated of African states against a latecomer to the scramble for Africa, It strips away the gloom of inevitability and, like the battle itself, puts history back into play. Part 1. The Road to Adwa Chapter 1. Courtly Ambitions It was an improbable beginning to one of the great political partnerships of modern times. Inside the oversized hut of branch and straw construction, the young charismatic king of Shoa sat cross-legged on a carpet-draped dais. A black silk cape with white embroidered trim covered his shoulders. A bandana of fine white silk wrapped his head from brow to nape, where it tied. Minilik combed his beard with his fingers as he sat alone 
under a royal canopy. Lieutenants in lion's mane headdresses and red trimmed tunics stood at either side, leaning on lances. The only illumination entered the room from doors on opposite sides. In the somber light, Minilig could make out the features of the engineers sent to him by Escher and Führer, a Swiss firm operating out of Aden. The man was young, tall, and broad-shouldered. He sported a long, full beard in the style of an Alfred Tennyson or a Frederick Engels. His name was Alfred Ilg. Although barely 65 at the time of the meeting in 1876, Minilik looked older than his years. His skin was deeply pitted, the traces of a bout with small spots small pox. It was a useful mask, a hardened look that belied the subtle, sensitive spirit within. Minilik was not a handsome man, but those who met him remarked on the warmth, kindness, and quiet power in his face. When the French geographer Alphonse Aubry met Minilik, in the 1880s, he noted, as everyone did, the obvious scarring on Minilik's face. But he also commented on Minilik's expressive eyes, which he described as, quote, quite beautiful, intelligent, and kind. Captain Longbois on mission, Longbois on mission to Minilik from the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs during the same years offered a similar description to the French Geographic Society suggesting that the smallpox scarring gave the king a, quote, hard air that was softened by his intelligent face and large black eyes full of tenderness and goodwill. The British journalist Augustus Wilde Wild couldn't see past the wide-brimmed black felt that the young Menelik made his trademark. Wilde dismissed it as an effect affectation affectation a two shilling black wide awake whether Minilik was aware that in ireland the wide awake was an emblem of anti-imperial resistance we will never know it may simply have been a sartorial preference years later the british diplomat sir renal rod met Minilik at court in Addis Ababa, and recalled his face as being, quote, full of character and quiet power, unquote. His manner, quote, dignified and at the same time cordially unreserved, quote, unquote. As for Ilg, he might have passed for a gentle school teacher with his wire spectacles and fair alpine complexion. In his early teens, Ilg had left Fronfeld, his hometown in the foothills of northern Switzerland, for secondary schooling in Zurich. He was barely 25 when he departed for the Red Sea in May 1876. In the company of two craftsmen from Zurich, the journey from the Somali coast to his meeting with Minilik in Ankobar must have given him pause. It certainly tried his patience. He was stuck on the coast at Zaila for weeks, waiting for a caravan into the Ethiopian highlands. The delay was a standard business practice in the coast, said to facilitate the emptying of the wallets of bored and impatient travelers. Once the journey was underway, it took a month and a half to make the climb through territories controlled by Afar tribesmen eager to extract tribute from travelers. Alfred Ilg was lured not only by the promise of work, but also by a sense of mission. He had taken inspiration from Werner Munzinger, a fellow Swiss of an earlier generation who had made a career for himself in Egypt. Munzinger had labored to fulfill Kadive Ismail's modernizing ambition for Egypt, serving the Khedive 
first in Cairo, then as governor of territories from the Red Sea to the Sudan in the 1870s, where Munzinger had a romantic penchant and fell hard for Ismail's vision of expansion and monumental grandeur, the renaissance of Egyptian imperial glory, Ilg's temperament was pr pragmatic. As an engineer, he tended to, to see modernization in technical terms, a set of discrete practical problems to be mastered. So did Menelik, the young monarch who hired the solemn Ilg to lead the technical modernization of his realm. Patient, practical, and open to the world, Ilg rapidly adapted to life in Ethiopia. He was an engineer, but also a realist. He soon reconciled his penchant for precision with the elastic standards of Ethiopia, where he noted, quote, time is a loose concept, unquote. Ilg shaved his tainusk beard, took an Ethiopian wife, started a family, and mastered Amharic. Okay, let me show you the two pictures that um, were shown in these two pages first before moving on. Um, this The first one is Minilik in 1888 with the, with the hat. And this is the Swiss um, engineer. Alfred Ilg. In 1896. Okay. Um, by the time he turned 30 in 1884, he had completed a slew of projects for Minelik. He was fast becoming royal architect and minister of bridges and roads. Ilg showed a knack not only for public works, but also for adapting Minelik's modernizing ambition to his resources. Soon Minelik and Taitu were giving Ilg shopping lists for his trips to Europe. He returned loaded down with the bric-a-brac of modern life and European technology. A printing press, wide-brimmed hats, a cartridge reloader, soap, a sturdy plow, fine footwear. Although Ilg's missions to Europe were largely matters of state, Empress Taitu didn't hesitate to write to modify her wishes, to remind Ilg of her preferences or to inform him of her shoe size. But she was far from frivolous and was just as likely to follow up with a note about agricultural machinery. Either way, whether pursuing public interest or private passion, she signed her letters, quote, Empress Taitu, Light of Ethiopia, unquote. By the time of Menelik's accession to the Ethiopian throne in 1889, Ilg had assumed additional functions as counselor of state. He put his f formidable language skills, French, German, Italian, English, Amharic, to work, never once hinting at ambitions beyond those of his pa patron and friend. The public works continued. In 1894, he completed a water con conduit from Ntoto to the imperial compound, by, but by then he was <clears throat> effectively operating as chief of staff. After Adwa, Menelik would turn to Ilg for guidance in the negotiations for the Italian prisoners. By turns builder, translator, arms merchant, and diplomat, Ilg was indispensable. He would serve Menelik for life. Par the partnership established between Menelik and Ilg would be decisive for the future of Ethiopia. By the time of their meeting, the fate of Africa seemed clear, inspired in part by the expansion of the United States and the manifest destiny that took European settler populations from sea to, sea to shining sea. European powers came increasingly to see Africa as the outlet for Europe's ambitions and its population. 
for a period of retrenchment during the revolutionary and napoleonic wars european expansion had begun anew european settlement in south africa recommenced after 1815 the conquest of north africa began with algeria in 1830 even though the atlantic slave trade was in decline by the second half of the century king leopold of belgium found that great wealth could still be extracted from the dark continent and employed the most brutal methods in doing so. Okay, I want to make sure I'm streaming because I'm not seeing any comments. Okay. Um. <laughs> Along the Portugal, along with Portugal and the Netherlands, Leopold's Belgium showed that even small powers could pursue grand ambitions in Africa. Meanwhile, Henry Morton Stanley turned African adventure into a manly sport, creating a book and lecture market for audiences primed for vicarious thrills. Vicarious thrills. All the same, it was the great powers who were amassing the greatest territory. Britain would eventually lay claim to land stretching from Cairo to the Cape. France, encouraged by Bismarck to seek compensation abroad. After defeat in the Franco-Prussian War of 1870, duly established interests in North and West Africa and defended toeholds on the Somali coast in the east. In 1884, Bismarck would convene a conference founded on the strong presumption that Africa's future would be European. When Minilik and Alfred Ilg met in 1878, that future was already closing in. The Campaign Against Tedros, Blueprint for Conquest <clears throat> Ethiopia in the 19th century was a collection of prov provinces ruled by kings, presided over by an emperor. Although principles of succession favored the eldest legitimate son of the previous emperor, there was plenty of room for interpretation and mischief. Prior to Menelik, Ethiopia had two great emperors in the 19th century, Tedros and Johannes. Both had risen from local power bases using tactics that often dressed blatant acts of banditry in the language of kingship. The image of the shifta or bandit looms large in the history of Ethiopia. It has even been said that the path of the shifta was, quote, the sure way of political power, unquote. Tedros, a shifta who was the son of a shifta, had clawed his way into power. The man who would become Emperor Tedros was born with the name Kasa Hailu in 1818, near Gondar in the west. Tedros was abandoned by his father and raised by his mother. Rivals mocked his lowly origins. They liked to point out that his mother had eked out a living selling koso, which rids the digestive system of worms. As a young man, Tedros adopted a classic strategy of rebellion followed by accommodation. He ratcheted his way up a regional figure, then used regional power and marriage to push aside rivals for the throne. He became emperor in 1855. Tedros set himself the task of unifying Eth Ethiopia and establishing Christian Ethiopia as a regional power. The 33-year-old British consul, Walter Plowden, encouraged him in this regard, writing earnest, earnest letters back to London about the man who would, quote, civilize and improve this distracted country, unquote. Tedros had decreed the ab abolition of the slave trade in Ethiopia, Plowden noted, just as he had outlawed the soldierly practice of taking trophies via castration from the bodies of fallen enemies. Such a sovereign, Plowden gushed, 
shall merit the support and friendship of Her Majesty's government. Unquote. Plowden apparently also encouraged the idea that Ethiopia and Britain might form an alliance of Christian brothers against Muslim Egypt. Tedros had seduced Tedros was seduced by the vision of Ethiopia as a unified Christian power whose authority stretched from the Ethiopian highlands down to the Red Sea. In 1856, he led his forces against the southern province of Shawa, whose king submitted and subsequently died of illness. The king's son, the young Minilik, was taken by Tedros for safekeeping. He later escaped. The campaigns of Tedros against the Muslim Oromo were less successful, and his armies never seriously threatened the Muslim towns and villages along the Red Sea coast. The Shifta heritage of Tedros ultimately worked against him. Contrary to Plowden's high hopes for Tedros, his exercise of power rarely rose above the predatory. Tedros and his armies were relentless in their campaigning. Scarcely distinguishable from organized banditry, as they fed themselves from crops and livestock in their path. When farmers appealed for a lighter touch, Tedros would blunt, quote, soldiers eat, peasants provide, unquote. Tedros relished his roguish image and took delight in his nickname, quote, Abba Bezbez, or taker of booty day after day. Farmers learned to thwart Tedros by driving off livestock and hiding the fruits of their harvest, and they tipped off their neighbors by lighting signal fires, warning of his movements. As his efforts at centralizing authority fo foundered, Tedros became frustrated. Tedros also suffered slights from European powers. A letter sent in 1862 intended for Queen Victoria languished unanswered in the British Foreign Office. And he became irritated by the presence of European missionaries, undes understandably so, for the, they seemed quite redundant in Christian Ethiopia. What Tedros really wanted was, quote, a cannon founder, a gunsmith, an iron smelter, a heavy artillery man, and a gunner. Unquote. Tedros put the missionaries to work in the construction of roads and a massive siege gun christened Sebastopol. Sebastopol. He also detained the British consul and, in this, overplayed his hand. Negotiations for the release of the consul and the missionaries led to deadlock. In 1867, Tedros simply ignored a British ultimatum for their release. The following year, the consul and missionary hostages became the object of a rescue mission undertaken by a British expedition force led by General Robert Napier. In late January 1868, a fleet of transport ships began to unload their cargo at Zula on the Red Sea coast just south of Masawa. The cargo included thousands of colonial trips from India, thousands of European British soldiers, and nearly 200 Chinese laborers for road building, more than 20,000 bodies in all, not counting 3,000 pack animals, including 45 Indian elephants. And uh, let me show you the image. Mm -hmm. Okay. The diverse co composition of Napier's expeditionary force amounted to a demonstration of the global military might of the British Empire. A few weeks later, the force began to move from the coast into the highlands. As the elephants lumbered along steep switchback trails, they carried dis 
assembled Armstrong field guns strapped to their sides and backs. The elephants were piloted by colonial troops from India. Tedros might have adopted guerrilla tactics, harassing Napier's, Napier's forces as their supply lines stretched. Instead, on April 10th, Good Friday, he put his infantrymen armed with rifles and spears in the open field against Napier's artillery and sharpshooters. The results were predictable and devastating. Hundreds of Ethiopian dead versus 20 wounded among Napier's men. Having failed at a show of force, Tedros tried negotiation. He released some of the hostages and made a gift of 1,000 cattle and 500 sheep in peace and friendship. Napier declined any peace offer that did not include the emperor himself. As Napier's expeditionary force clo closed in on the imperial re redoubt at Magdala, Tedros's authority vanished. When British forces moved up the mountainside and raced to free the hostages, Tedros put the barrel of a pistol in his mouth and pulled the trigger. Britain had no interest in the conquest of Ethiopia. There was no ulterior motive, no secret plan to occupy Ethiopia. Britain's gripe was with Tedros, not the Ethiopian people. After the rescue of the hostages, Napier packed up his things and left. When the British departed, they left behind two things, weapons and a blueprint for conquest. Casa of Tigray, a local co collaborator, had offered safe passage to Napier's forces and secure supply lines in the pursuit of Tedros. The pre predations of Tedros had created a population that was ready for a champion, and Casa found that the role of champion suited his imperial ambitions. The departing British rewarded Casa with a healthy stock of rifles and ammunition. With Tedros out of the way, the British gift of guns and ammo was enough to tip the uh, ensuing succession battle in Casa's favor. But although the British were themselves not interested in Ethiopia, Napier's mission set an example for Egypt and Italy who were. The British had shown how to take down an Ethiopian emperor by allying themselves with an internal rival. By using Casa against Tedros, the Napier mission drafted the bl blueprint for subsequent campaigns. One might add that the relative ease of the Napier rescue mission gave a quite false impression of the tenacity and fighting skills of Ethiopians, a misapprehension that would cost others dearly. Egypt moves against Ethiopia. Over the next three years, and thanks to his hefty arsenal, Kasa consolidated his power and dispatched his rivals. In January 1872, his, he assumed the imperial throne. He took the title of Johannes IV when he received the crown in a coronation ceremony in the holy, holy city of Aksum. While Ethiopia was distracted by the Napier mission and its aftermath, Egypt pursued its vision of grandeur. Khadiv Ismail imagined a modern Egypt that would recapture the glory of ancient Egypt through aggressive expansion into Sudan, Ethiopia, and the Somali coasts. Egyptian forces pushed south along the Red Sea coast, seizing Massawa in 1865. Ismail installed Werner Munzinger, a Swiss adventurer, voyager, and agent for hire as governor of Amasawa. Following Napier's lead, Ismail sought an internal Ethiopian ally who might challenge Johannes. Menelik had already demonstrated a stubborn independence, withholding recognition of Johannes and his claim to the title of emperor. And Menelik's location? At Johannes's back, 
as he faced the Egyptians in the north, would distract Johannes as the Egyptians maneuvered against him. Menelik would serve nicely as an ally to Egypt. In 1875, the Egyptians occupied Harar, a major trading station and the endpoint of caravans coming up to Shawa from Djibouti. With Harar, Egypt had control of Menelik's main outlet to the sea. Very little left Shoa except by way of Harar, the very little entered, and very little entered. The Egyptians thus had considerable leverage over Menelik. At the same time, they began to offer Menelik the firearms that would be useful in his ongoing quarrel with Johannes, as they consolidated control over a position that could choke off Menelik's access to the wider world. Johannes had Johannes represented a significant obstacle to Egyptian ambitions, both because his power base was close at hand in northern Ethiopia and because Johannes took seriously his role as defender of the Christian faith. Johannes cast the Egyptian incursions both as territorial aggression as the and as the return of a conquering Islam. And indeed, Egypt went after areas, Masawa, the Red Sea coast, Harar, where Islam had been durably established. In 1875, Egypt organized a large force against Johannes. It consisted of some 15,000 Egyptian soldiers commanded by veterans of the German wars of the 1860s, Danes, Germans, Austrians, as well as veterans of the American Civil War. Hmm. The objective of this force was to bring about the downfall of Johannes by threatening the area north of the Mareb River and west of the Red Sea, roughly speaking the territory that would become Eritrea. Eritrea. At the same time, Werner Munzinger, Egypt's governor of Massawa, accompanied a shipment of firearms to Menelik. However, Menzinger's group of 400 never reached Menelik. By November 7, 1875, Menzinger and his party, including his Ethiopian wife and child, were annihilated by Afar, who preyed on trade to Shoah. The very same day, the Egyptian force invading from north was checked by Johannes at Gundet. A few months later, Johannes' advance guard, led by a bright and brave young commander named Alula, engaged the Egyptians at Gura. The Egyptians suffered a devastating defeat, a rout and a massacre, losing half their men in battle. Defeat at Gura shattered Ismail's dream of an African empire for Egypt. Indeed, it set in motion events that would lead to his downfall three years later. It solidified Ethiopia's claim on what would become Eritrea. Or Eritrea. Victory at Gura secured Alula's reputation as Ethiopia's fiercest defender. Johannes conferred upon Alula the lofty title of Ras and installed Alula in the town of Asmara, in the highlands above Masawa, thus making the man and the town of Hub the town the hub of his defense against any future threats. Then Johannes turned against his perceived enemies. Egypt's Muslim strategy made him wary of Ethiopia's Islamic minority. In 1880, he issued a proclamation in which he invited Ethiopian Muslims either to convert to Christianity or leave. Then he moved against Menelik and forced him to pay homage. Johannes sealed the deal by marrying his son to Menelik's daughter in 1882. This patched up relations, though the animosity never really subsided. Menelik never renounced his ambition to topple Johannes and rule Ethiopia. Rather, Menelik pursued the imperial crown by other means. At about the time that Menelik was marrying off his daughter to the son of Johannes, he began to court the woman who would serve as his most important political ally. 
Ethiopia's power couple, Minilig and Taitu. Taitu Betul had a restless heart and an iron will. When Minilik courted Taitu, he was merely king of Shaw, but he articulated loftier ambitions. Minilik laid claim to the Ethiopian throne thanks to lineage reaching back to King Solomon and the Queen of Sheba. According to Cabra Nagast, the compendium of tradition and law, Ethiopia must be ruled by someone of such descent. So Minilik was both confirming to tradition and staking a claim, as had Tedros and Johannes before him. As for Taitu, marriage to Minilik would fulfill a prophecy of royal destiny. An early photograph shows a woman with high, full cheeks, full lips, and a narrow jaw. She wore her hair in cornrow braids that followed the arc of her ears and were collected in a ponytail at the back. She was famous for her slender fingers and her light complexion, a gift of her Oromo Arab descent. She was also known for her wealth, including holdings in farmland and pasture. She was connected to an extensive network of wealth and power through relatives. Here is the picture. That is Taitu. Okay. The partnership between Menelik and Taitu was one of the great political unions of modern times. That Menelik and Taitu had a mutual affection no one would deny. Candid photos taken of their domestic life years later show a, lo a level of comfort with each other that would be difficult to fake. They made a point of eating meals together and their interactions were described as attentive and tender. But as it was not the first marriage for e either of them, their romantic illusions had been tempered. By the time Minilik met Daitu, the marriage with his first wife, the princess Aldash, daughter of the emperor Tedros, was over. It was a marriage whose utility died with Tedros. Minilik moved on to the courtesan Bafena, a woman whose extraordinary beauty clouded Menelik's judgment, blinding him to her intrigues against him, until Taitu entered the picture. When Menelik and Taitu sealed their union on Easter Sunday in 1883, it was a carefully considered act. It was also a union of destinies. In Menelik, Taitu saw a vehicle for her ambitions. In Taitu, Menelik saw wealth, political smarts, and connections in a part of the country he would have to win over if he was to rule Ethiopia. If Menelik and Taitu were running for office in an American presidential election, it would be said that Taitu brought geographical balance to the ticket. The North had been the home of Ethiopia's most recent emperors. Both Tedros and Johannes had been from the North. So there was a strong presumption in favor of nor northerners when it came to imperial succession. Taitu was born in Semien near Tigray, a large, rich northern province. The, fam the family had contacts throughout the north, including Tigray and Begamdar. Menelik was from the south, so Taitu brought him a kind of local legitimacy. In politics, Taitu's quick wit and acute political sense brought balance to Menelik's cautious and deliberate leadership. Although Taitu was of Oromo and thus Muslim heritage, the family had converted in the 18th century, confirming both the ideal of Christian Ethiopia and the savvy opportunism of her family. Since then, the family had accumulated significant property. Taitu gave Menelik a shrewd, wealthy, energetic political partner with a power base in the north, confirming Menelik as a leader with a claim to truly national credentials. Taitu made the most of her position of power. Although she could tolerate the company of Europeans made sh and made sure to invite them to royal events, her mistrust of Europeans was visceral. 
it was said that she could not abide their odor. At court, she anchored the anti-European faction. In policy discussion, discussions, she could always be counted on to define political choices in trenchant terms, farming the debate. Some cre credited her with choosing the site for Menelik's new capital, Addis Ababa. She took an active interest in the life of the capital, seeing it as an extension of her home and the most important theater for country courtly performance and the display of political power. Under her watchful and benevolent eye, Addis became the venue for the dispensing of both justice and royal largesse. She kept a close watch on Menelik's companions. Menelik was far from faithful, and while Daitu would tolerate his infidelities, she would not put up with rivals. Daitu was credited with the death by poison of one of his lovers. Rumors circulated that it was not an isolated event. Her methods could be pitiless, but her anxiety was not unjustified. As one of her prominent critics observed, the queen today may only may be only a woman tomorrow. Hmm. Daitu's self-regard was legendary. It was remarked more than once that she composed her inner circle carefully, choosing women with darker complexions, the better to show off her own light coffee skin. Whether in Ankober, in Toto, or the new capital, Addis Ababa, Daitu was rarely seen without her full entourage. Daitu went about the city astride her mule with the royal red umbrella that both shielded her from the sun and announced her royal presence. As she moved about the city, custom demanded gestures of abeyance. These were sometimes offered perfunctorily or nullified by muttered insults, hyena, and worse. In time, her vanity became a political liability, as her public gestures of Christian devotion crossed cross the line from exemplarily to ostentatious. Her motives became suspect, as if piety had become simply another vehicle of self-promotion. Such criticism was to be expected of a woman who exercised power confidently. In the end, even her critics accorded her respect, however reluctantly. Nicola de, Ma de Amato didn't like Aitu, but he couldn't help admiring her, and he acknowledged that her unfavorable image owed something to her, quote, her political per perspicacity, unquote, and her, quote, rare quick quit, unquote. But animosity toward Daitu wasn't simply a reflection of the grudging respect accorded a powerful woman. Daitu was another, anything but a pleaser. She seems genuinely not to have cared whether she was liked. In the end, her understanding of power owed something to Machiavelli. It was said that while the gentle Menelik was loved, Daitu was feared.